Our guest today is Seth Godin. Seth, welcome to Free Your Inner Guru. It's a pleasure to have you here. Oh, so thrilled to talk to you, Laura. Thanks for having me. So just a very quick backgrounder. If a listener has been listening consistently over the course of the last year and a half, they're probably familiar that I've been in your ecosystem doing some learning of my own because on one hand, I'm one part teacher and coach and I'm forever a learner. And, uh, and so I've been in and out of your courses the last 18 months and you have a new book that is being released at the time of this episode's release called The Practice. And I want to talk to you about that book, but I'd also like to talk about some of your bigger picture work. And one of the things that you set out in many of your programs, it's there and every, you know, it's there, whether it's overt or on the side, is that the work that we do is about changing people for the better or creating a change. And I thought with time one-on-one -on -one with you, I wanted to ask you, what is the change you seek to make? Um, first, thank you for the work you're doing in our workshops. And I, I, they're not courses on purpose. They're workshops because courses don't work. We're the only people who can change. And we change by leaning into the process, doing the things and learning. And you are doing that and you are modeling that. And so I thank you. Uh, the change I seek to make is we all grew up indoctrinated, indoctrinated in many things, particularly industrialism and uh, caste. Industrialism, the idea of fitting in, doing what we're told, waiting to be picked, uh, seeking the cheapest, fastest alternative, conforming, complying, being coerced, the education system. And caste, because we are trained from a very early age to judge people by their appearance, and lots of things that are completely irrelevant to how they can contribute. And it is widespread. Indoctrination of all sorts tries very hard to not be noticed. That part of what makes indoctrination work is that we deny it occurs. And since we don't see it, we can't work on it. And my work you know, began by uh, sort of undermining the TV industrial complex and the way marketers had been persuaded to steal people's attention and make average stuff for average people. And it has evolved through the years to get much more about individuals, about their ability to ship creative work and make things better. It seems like a natural extension. Did you find that in coming through the marketing lens, that's, that's towards the end of the creative process. That's once you have something to spread and, and share with, with people. Did you, were, what you, were you observing that, that turned you in that direction? Well, I get to use words any way I want, and I use the word marketing to define anything we do that interacts with the market. It doesn't mean advertising or hype. So if you decide to write a symphony, the decision to write it is a marketing choice. If you decide to offer a money back guarantee, that's a marketing choice. If you decide to jump, to dump stuff in uh, Lake Ontario, that's poisonous because you're too cheap to recycle it. That is a marketing choice because the market will hear about it. The market will interact with it. And what I found was that as I talked to organizations and individuals about things they thought were marketing, I kept bumping into two things. One, the brainwashing of indoctrination that people felt like it wasn't their turn to do good work. And two, this belief that marketing came at the end. And so I just kept following the thread all the way to this core principle of what does it mean to pick yourself and what does it mean to take responsibility for what we're capable of doing. What do you mean by, by pick yourself? Well, you know, the, the world I grew up in is a world based on scarcity. Uh, only a few people get an A, only a few people get into a famous college, only a few people get to the placement office, only a few people get to be on Oprah on, on, and on, and on. Scarcity is a core tenet, not just a side effect of the industrial age. The corner office, there's only four corners. The corner office is scarce. And um, we optimized and good parents optimized to get picked or to have our kids get picked. That's why the sticker is on the back of your car. That's why the list of people pitching to get on someone's podcast is enormous. Um, 
And then it all changed. And it changed because attention changed and because the long tail showed up. And because if you want to sing, you can sing. And if you want to teach, you can teach and no one can stop you. And so instead of waiting for Oprah to call, because I got to tell you, she and I were talking this morning, she's not going to call. Um, you get to pick yourself. You get to pick yourself by saying, I'm going to lead. Who wants to follow me? I'm going to show up with something generous. Who would like to engage with me? And the smallest viable audience is not that many people. And so you can show up in the world for not that many people and be proud of the work you do. So, and that seems to fly in the face of the culture of, of seeking fame mm -hmm. or fame as the benchmark or even the goal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. There's different kinds of fame. So let's be clear on social media. People who are called friends are not your friends and people who are followers are not your followers and people who like you don't really like you. These are just shorthands, easy to measure. And so, yeah, there are people who are dramatically more famous than me. And I think that's fine. I don't want to be famous, but it's also possible to have a circle of people, a tribe, a community that would miss you if you are gone. And I don't think that's fame. I think that's doing something with meaning. And I think that's being of use. And that is not overrated. That's underrated. One of the, over the course of the last 18 months, one of the shifts that came in how I see the world with regards to marketing, as you say, or anything that I put out is this idea of um, empathy and, and generosity as the core values. And I would even go so far as to say the compass. Yeah. What, yeah. Um, can you speak to that? Um, assuming that this would be like a first exposure to, to somebody sure. who's listening. So let me, let me try to make it really practical and not spiritual in any way. If I have 10 nickels and I'm generous and give three of them to you, I don't have them anymore. And so a mindset of scarcity has a lot of trouble working in a world of generosity. But if I have an idea and I share it with eight people and it helps them, I still have the idea. And the idea is now worth more because other people have it, not less. And so that's the first principle, which is the enemy is not piracy, it's obscurity, as Tim O'Reilly says. The second element is this. Lots of us good people have been trained to hold back because it feels like we're taking if we bring our work to the world. That it feels like a taking that's where imposter syndrome comes from. Who am I to speak up? Who am I to lead? Who am I to contribute? And so we get really hung up and censor ourselves because we say, I'm not going to pick myself because that would be arrogant. Well, there's a solution. And the solution is to act like a lifeguard. That if you're uh, on the dock on Canoe Lake up in Algonquin Park and someone four feet away from you is drowning, you don't look around to say, who has a, bro a bronze medallion? I don't. You don't look around to say, who can prove they're a better swimmer than me? You just jump in the water and save the person's life. Of course you do, because that's the generous thing to do. You're not going to stand there and say, I'm an imposter and watch this person drown. And so the opportunity is to realize our craft, our work, our art is an act of generosity. That if we can get out of our head that we are taking, and instead embrace the fact that we have a chance to give, then we're more likely to do it. Now, you can't use this as an excuse to hustle people. You can't use this as an excuse to take. What you can use it as is fuel for finding the thing inside of you that you know you can actually contribute and that you would be glad you did, even or particularly because you're not getting paid for it, simply because you can. I got to see, and I think you got to see at the same time, um, earlier in the year, I, um, I joined this workshop of yours called the Creatives Workshop. And it started, um, it was actually an interesting decision for me because it was based on a daily practice. And it started right when I went away for two weeks vacation. <laughs> so from Smart day one, 
<laughs> yeah, right. So for from day one, it's like wow, incoming, and and then something happened. There was a pandemic. Yeah, and I, I actually I, I'm going to take this as an opportunity to I think I expressed it in writing in the workshop, but I don't know that I would have gone been able to um, do as well through those first three months without that daily presence whether I wrote or not, um, but in there in the community. And I think we saw something extraordinary happen there that was based on generosity. Yeah. No, it was a balm for a lot of people, including us. And, um, you know, it's worth taking a moment right now just to say how many people have been impacted by the pandemic, by the recession, and by the long overdue focus on racial injustice, all three of them, all at the same time. and. Uh, I just, you know, I'm so privileged, so lucky, but it also has affected me. It's affected the people around me. And if it's affecting the people who are listening to this, my heart goes out to them. And then that happened. So now what are we going to do? And that's all we can do is now what are we going to do? And I think we have this opportunity to take a deep breath and say, well, normal's gone. And I could wait for normal to come back, I could wait to get picked, or I could say, how can I make things better? How can I connect and lead and contribute and make things better? Because we know every single time the world has gone sideways, you know, the, the Spanish flu, World War II, make your, pick your choice. The world gets better because people show up, not from the top, not because it's an edict, but because human beings say, how can I make things better? And in that, so I want to tie this to the, to the practice, to, to the book. Um, how, where were you in your, pra in your practice of building this book when you launched that workshop? So the workshop took longer to build than any other workshop we've ever done. Um, I built the Alt-MBA after 20 years of thinking in five days. Um, but this workshop took over a year of working on it almost all every day because I needed to think through how do I help people go so deep about this thing that they feel is unattainable and how do I help people turn pro when many of them would rather remain amateur and there's nothing wrong with hobbies I love hobbies but we needed to open the door for people who want their hobby to be bigger than a hobby and help them get to the next level without feeling icky. And that process was, it took me a lot of thinking. And then as I was building the workshop over the course of that year plus, I realized there's probably a book in this. And so I based the book on the workshop, not the other way around. Mm. And being able to watch the people in the workshop engage with the lessons fueled my ability to write the book. And there was, I mean, there were, so I'm, as you, if I'm a coach and podcaster who based on that, on that experience decided to make the podcast the first thing mm -hmm. and the writing, the second thing and let everything else go right in the middle of the pandemic. Right. <laughs> right. Some of it went for me. But um, from before it all went down, I said to a friend on the phone um, from Kauai, um, I think I need to just, you know, clear the deck and really look at this. And that was just in the beginning stages. And what I found was, first of all, I went from somebody who defiantly did not care about streaks to someone who became all about the streak. Mm -hmm. for as long as I could sustain it. And so I'd love to like, why, why do you think streaks are so important? Why do you advocate for them? So you quite fiercely and directly. I can't advocate for streaks until I have your buy-in that you actually care enough to ship creative work, that you care enough to find your voice. If you don't, it's none of my business, right? That's totally cool. But if you do, then let's just pretend for a minute you told me you wanted to run the marathon and that you were going to train whenever you felt like it, if it was sunny. 
And I was like, no, you told me you want to run the marathon. The way you run the marathon is you train for the marathon. And that means you become a runner. And what it means to become a runner is not that someone picks you, but that you run, that you run every day or five days a week or whatever your practice is. That's what makes you a runner. Well, if you want to be a creative, I don't know a professional creative who says, I only create when I feel like it. What professional creators say is, I create things and then I feel like it. It goes in that order. I don't wait to find flow before I start doing the work. I do work and that helps me find flow. And so in my case, I decided 7,500 blog posts ago to blog every day. So tomorrow, Wednesday, for me anyway, uh, my blog will come out between four and five o'clock in the morning. And it will not come out because it's the best blog post I ever wrote. It's unlikely to be the best blog post I ever wrote. It will come out because it's tomorrow. And I don't have to revisit that decision. I made that decision once a long time ago. And so I don't waste any brain space about if. It's all about when, right? I am going to do this. Will I do it like this or like that? Because I've already determined it's going to happen. And that's totally different than looking at the work and saying, is this good enough? Because that's a, a trap. It's a hole that you can't get yourself out of. That's that perfection trap. Right, because perfection has nothing to do with perfect and perfect has very little to do with good enough. Good enough is a very specific term. And what it means is it's good enough. And so we ship it and go on to the next thing. No extra points for being better than good enough because otherwise just redefine good enough to be what you need it to be and that is good enough. So doing the rough math on 7,500, I'm estimating, and I'm not a mathematician, I'm estimating, is that 20 years? Yes. So it's 20 years, maybe I am a mathematician. Um, <laughs> so that's 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, you made this decision. And did you have any of this, like, who do you think you are to think that people will want to hear from you every day? Well, there, so there's two parts to that question. Um, I didn't decide to blog every day because I thought anyone was going to read it. So that's the first thing is we have to forgive the audience. We cannot say I'm going to expose myself to this effort and trials and tribulations and the audience better show up. The audience is not part of that deal. It's not the deal. The deal is I'm going to do this work, period. That's all. And if they show up, they show up. If they like it, they like it. Not my problem. My problem is, committing to the practice. And then other things will happen and I can learn from what works and what doesn't, but I've still committed to the practice. And the second thing you're bringing up is imposter syndrome, which I hear about now and then. Lots of people think they're the only person with imposter syndrome, that they feel like a fraud, who am I to do this, etc. And they're sometimes surprised to discover that almost every good person has it. And particularly if you're doing anything that involves leadership or creativity. And they say, how do I get rid of this? And they're surprised at my answer because I say, the reason you feel like an imposter is you are one. And the reason you are is because you are saying something in advance of it being true, right? So if you have a comedy show and you say, I'm a comedian, you are an imposter. You don't know that the audience will think you're funny until after the evening is over. You are telling the truth in advance. And that's a generous act if you have any evidence to believe that you are funny. So what we do when we're leading is we take people to a place we are not sure is going to work. That's a generous act. And if it makes us feel like an imposter, then we should say thank you. Thanks for reminding me I'm on the right path. If you don't feel like an imposter, then you're probably just phoning it in. I think when, um, certainly I can speak to this from my own experience, but when, when people decide to express what's meaningful to them, it's inherently more vulnerable. And so whether it's, whether it's good or not, it's that vulnerability of it. Like it matters much more to me what I do today than when I used to sell computer systems into car dealerships. Because at the end of the day, I cared about the trip to Ireland or the trip to mm -hmm. Hawaii or the trip here far more 
than I cared about the computer system in the car dealership. Yeah, that's a big mistake. It's a big well, mistake. So back before we were all housebound, I was walking past a small park on the corner of Amsterdam Avenue and 76th Street in Manhattan. And I heard from inside the park, a four-year-old in a taunting voice. And this kid was making fun of me. He was making fun of I, either my appearance or my haircut or something. He was taunting me. A playground bully was taunting me. And I have to tell you, he didn't land a finger. Not, not a bit. I didn't care that a four-year-old didn't like me. Because I didn't know him and he didn't know me. But when I was six, if that had happened, I would have been crushed. What's the difference? The difference is not in the kid, it's in the person who's hearing the voice. And if we decide that an unqualified critic truly knows us, truly sees us, truly understands our work, and that we will incorporate their criticism into our self-image, that was a mistake. Because they don't know us. They don't know what we want. They don't know what we're capable of. They just know themselves. And what they're saying to you in that moment is, I don't get the joke, or I'm afraid, or I'm having a bad day. They might just be saying, it's not for me. But they use words like, you're a bad person, right? And we take it personally because it's a good place to hide. Because then we can say, I'm never doing that again because it's safer. But what happened is it all occurred because we were attached to the outcome. We did the work hoping insisting that the audience would get the joke. And professionals have to be able to say, there's two things going on here. Thing number one is, I did a thing, I put on a show, and it didn't work for this kind of person. Can I learn from that so I can put on a different show next time? And the second thing is, I'm me. They don't know me. They just told me my show didn't work, but they didn't say I didn't work. And they're different things. And what it means to be a professional is to say, I will bring a version of me to this place in exchange for people's time or attention or money, but it's never going to be me because I am invisible. No one knows the voice in your head other than you. I'd love to, um, you've mentioned professional and amateur. And um, I feel like the conversation isn't complete without talking about the hack. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you delineate between the, the, pro the professional isn't, isn't lots of people get paid for things, but they wouldn't qualify as professional um, under this in construct. Yeah. Right. So, so let, let's go through them. The professional is someone who ships. Rely yeah, the words are going to get complicated because they don't all fit on the same graph, but I'd love to just, let's dive into the word hack because the word For hack sure. really punches people's buttons. Yeah. I, I picked it on purpose. Um, what does it mean to be a hack? So I would argue, for example, someone who uh, back in the day performed uh, in a band at weddings at a fair price was a hack because they're playing cool in the gang three times a weekend. They're showing up, playing the music the bride wants exactly the way the bride wants it, the same time, every time, over and over again. And they're getting paid to do it. They might enjoy the work, but they are not saying, I am inventing new art here. They're saying, Casey and the Sunshine Band couldn't make it, cool in the gang couldn't make it, we're here instead. This is pretty good music for a pretty good wedding at a pretty good price, thank you very much. And the world needs hacks, and these musicians are hacks. They should not be confused for one minute believing that they are Christian McBride or Patricia Barber or Cyrilla May, because those people are professional artists who regularly go outside an envelope and fail, who regularly challenge the audience to go a place that maybe the audience doesn't want to go, who regularly don't make as much money as they could because they don't play covers of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And this choice is a very real choice. And there's nothing wrong with saying I'm a hack. I'm a hack copywriter. I'm a hack SEO person. I'm a hack blogger. I'm a hack whatever. Tell me what you need. I'll do it for you. 
right? That's what I want when I get my heater fixed in my house. I want a hack HVAC person. Come and do the work exactly the way it needs to be done. Thank you very much. But if I was going to hire an architect to build a new house, I don't think I'd want to hire a hack architect. I want a house that every time I saw it, it filled me with pride and magic and joy because something came out of nothing. And sometimes that kind of architect builds a house that doesn't work very well because they don't know. And you got to pick. And one journey is way rougher than the other. And the mistake we make is denigrating either journey or thinking we're doing one when we're doing the other. Mm. And um, there's nothing wrong with being a hack. I've done hack work in my life, but the days that I remember are the days where I turned down hack work and took the risk of being a creative professional instead. What about, where do you think this, the conversation about the hack fits in sort of digital culture in terms of either what we see online as far as um, businesses being, I'm air quoting marketing, uh, marketed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause to me, when I was, when I was taking that in the first number of times, it was providing me with a bit of a lens to the work of a hack, say a hack coach or the, the maybe it's a more pejorative um, take on the word hack, but that instant promise or, you know, in the, res- the promise of instant results. To me, yeah. that's a full on hack in the, in the, and using the word in the most critical way possible. Well, why does it work? It works because some customers want it, right? Now, I don't think it lets you off the hook morally to do that. And so we can have a whole moral conversation about whether giving customers what they want is always the right thing to do. I don't think it's okay to be a marketer for a cigarette company. I don't think it's, it's okay to you know lobby for shale oil extraction just because you can get paid to do so. That's a hack job that's also immoral. Um, but what we do know is that the world is ready to pay someone to be an SEO practitioner who doesn't invent any new SEO technique and just sits there with a checklist. And I don't think that's immoral. I think that that's being a cog in the industrial system of how attention is spread around the internet. Um, But it's up to each of us if we're picking ourselves to decide what we wanna be known for. And I think it's essential that we not permit ourselves or anyone else deniability just because it's doing my job. I think if you're doing your job, you're responsible for the work, whether or not someone asked you to do it. Mm. Um, a bit of a, a shift in, in, in focus, but this morning here, so we're recording in September for a later release, but um, the kids went to online school this morning, mm-hmm. the teenagers, the Toronto um, school board. And, uh, and on the news, they were using the words synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. Wow. And I'm a former, I I started out as a teacher. So all this stuff resonates with me. Right. And, and, uh, and, and you've, at least in any of the experiences that I've gone with, have chosen to go down the path of asynchronous learning, which literally means people learning at different times or participating at different times, most of the time. Yep. Why did you, why did you make that, that decision? And, and uh, because that was the first time for me. I've gone through a number of workshops or coaches that were synchronous. I've put them on myself and it's caused a, it's caused a a flip in my thoughts around how best to um, serve my audience going forward. It's a great question. So first one more reason I love Canada because in the United States, you can't say asynchronous on the radio too many syllables. Um, yeah, and it wasn't even the CBC. It was. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> yeah. uh, so here's the thing. Um, there's a very long history in media. Marshall McLuhan from Toronto uh, wrote about this, the backing and forthing between synchronous and asynchronous communication. So synchronous communication is a conversation with your friend. Asynchronous is sending them a telegram, right? You don't have to write back immediately. Then it becomes synchronous again when we switch to the telephone. Then it becomes asynchronous when we switch back to email. 
It goes back and forth and back and forth. YouTube is asynchronous. You're not watching the person live on video, not most of the time, right? And so when I looked at online education more than five years ago, I wanted to understand where could I be a contribution and what pioneering needed to be done. And what we had built was a multi-billion dollar enterprise around synchronized lectures. You got to go to the room and you got to hear the teacher teach live. There's not a lot of good reason for that if there isn't an interaction that follows. Listening to a lecture live is a huge waste, huge, because someone had to perform for you and the chances it's the best performance of that lecture ever done are zero. And so TED Talks taught us that asynchronous lectures tend to be more entertaining, better produced, and easier to resonate and, and share than synchronized lectures. Okay, but then how do I add the workshop part? Because the problem is you can watch all the TED Talks you want, they don't change your life because you're not actually modeling the behavior. And what I knew is that the internet is big enough that if you have enough people doing something asynchronous, it can start to feel like it's synchronous. Because in our workshops at, at akimbo.com, you'll see a new post every 60 seconds, 24 hours a day. And that only takes 700 people to get to that level of participation. So what we've built is this place where there's an opening where you are never hesitating to speak. In a synchronized workshop, you can't do that because it's someone else's turn to talk. In an asynchronized workshop, it's never somebody else's turn to talk if you're ready to speak. And then people can see what you wrote a week ago or a month ago. That leave, leaves you room to change. And so I couldn't be more thrilled at the kinds of interaction we're getting. Inside the Creators Workshop, there were more than half a million posts back and forth from fewer than 800 people. That's insane. I believe there it. Was no trolling, <laughs> there was no yelling, and it wasn't just, you know, LOL. It was long, detailed backs and forths. We changed lives because we gave people an open door to go through to have their lives changed. They did the work. We just built the platform. You know, I um, one thing that I often say is environment always wins. And so that's this something happens in the environment that makes it conducive for that level of conversation. Yeah. And on one hand, it's going to be, it's going, it's going to be who, you know, as the as the lightning rod for it, it's going to be who you attract and who yep. your people attract. But on the other hand, it's about the agency and the expression of the people coming in. Exactly. Right. Feeling the environment and feeling safe to, yeah. to do that. And that's why we can't have grades and we can't have class rank and we can't have tests because those are all education tropes and education tropes are about compliance and unsafety. School works because they make kids feel unsafe. They say, you better do this or I'll tell your parents. You better do this, or you'll get a D. You better do this or I'll hold you back. These are all incentives built around unsafety. And mm -hmm. I, the more I think about education, the less I like it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, and this is, I'm working through some of this for how I go forward. So thank you because you're, you're the leader in this um, dynamic showing me something different, which I've been so grateful for all the way along. Um, just going back to the practice again, one of the, one of the ideas that, that you bring forward in um, the creatives workshop and, and the practice, and I think in, in a, one or two of the other um, platform discussions is this idea of genre mm -hmm. and and really knowing the genre that you're in, which I saw and I'm sure and I remember that at first being the creatives workshop, there was a fair amount of there were the willing learners like me going, okay, let's see what he has to say about this. <laughs> I'm in here to be myself and find my voice. <laughs> and and then there were people who really resisted the idea of hey, you know, understanding a genre and and finding a place to fit yeah. inside it. Um, where do I want to go with this? Because I want to tie the practice to it because right. I sense a genre that could 
could be shifted a little bit with this work. Yeah. Now, this was one of my biggest surprises because it was the like seventh or eighth workshop we built. And I really thought genre was going to be like a layup. People would get the joke. I had to add two more videos about it and spend a lot of, and still people are tying themselves into knots to come up with some way that they can be right and I'm right too. Like my genre is this, 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 this. No, that's not your genre. That's just what you feel like doing right now. And you're annoyed that the world doesn't applaud you. That's not a genre. Genre is what does this remind me of? And if you're not reminding me of something I admire, then I'm not likely to admire you. It's that simple, right? And so the thing is, your genre could be, I am a off the wall punk creator of things you've never seen before. That's a genre, but people in that genre rarely get on the Tonight Show. You can't have both, right? And, and so for people um, who are listening, because they can't see us talking, I guess, but on the wall behind you is, uh, is it two or three pieces of art? It might be three. It's two. Two, two pieces of art uh, that look like they were from the, uh, the glacial shield in Canada with a pine tree and a, a, a fjord and stuff. And it's in the genre of Tom Thompson, group of seven. It's not Tom Thompson, but it reminds me of Tom Thompson. And so I can look at that art and I'm judging you because you have that art on your wall because it means you and I have something in common. And it also sends a signal about who you are and what you admire. Now, if I was sitting in a different setting and I saw that on the wall, it wouldn't be right, right? Like if I'm at, in the waiting room at Sotheby's Contemporary Art and that's on the wall, I'm like, wait, is that supposed to be ironic? Why is that? And so genre sends all of these messages before we show up because the fact is no one can sample your work until they decide to commit their attention to your work. And they're only going to commit their attention to work that has a genre they're interested in. So we get to put up a label, and if we refuse to put up a label, we're invisible. And you know, years ago, I managed a folk singer, and there was a club in Cambridge called Passim. And Passim specialized in solo singer-songwriters who had an acoustic guitar. Now, should talking heads been allowed to play at Passim? Because they had electricity. Well, I don't know, because the people who went to Passim didn't go to hear talking heads. They went to hear Tracy Chapman, right? And that's a genre. So when I challenge people who say they want to be creative professionals, what's your genre? And they're insulted. Well, what's really going on is they're hiding. They're hiding because they're worried that if they tell people what their genre is, they're going to let them down because they're not good enough to expand the genre, to be an important part of the genre. Fact is, there's a difference between Joni Mitchell and the local not very good singer-songwriter. Joni Mitchell was definitely in the singer-songwriter category, genre, but she made it hers. And you only have to hear one bar of, you know, Big Yellow Taxi to know that Joni's in the house. So you can be distinctive and idiosyncratic and peculiar, but you still got to be in a genre. When you say it that way, it's almost like genre is the umbrella and then your idiosyncrasy and peculiarity fit fit inside it yeah um so with the practice what genre of book would you consider it so in books it's super easy because you say what section of the bookstore should this be in so i wrote a book called vias for vulnerable that looks like a kid's book and barnes and noble put it in the kids book section so it didn't sell but it's a business book it just looks wrong so it went to the wrong place I published a book called Free Prize Inside that was a marketing book, but we shipped it in a cereal box and Barnes and Noble didn't know what to do with it. So it didn't sell because they didn't know what to do with it. So where are we telling them to put the practice? I am fortunate that I get to say it goes in the Seth Godin section. Because <laughs> I've written 20 bestsellers. That's where it goes. Right. This is a book for people who like books by Seth Godin. Now, if you never heard of me, you're only going to engage with it because someone who has heard of me tells you about it. And so I had to write a book that would make your life better if you tell your friends. And so that is the genre it's in, which is 
This is the kind of book that you will feel okay telling your friends about. Now, if you don't have the advantage I have, then yeah, you got to say this is a business book and it goes in the business book section between the war of art and the art of possibility. Okay, that's a section. And my book belongs in between the war of art and the art of possibility. And I wrote it to fit in that genre. So that means there's not a lot of color pictures inside and it doesn't like veer into woo woo stuff about unproven scientific principles because those things aren't part of the genre. I'll tell you where, how I'm going to use the book is that it's a book that, you know, it's parsed out into numbered sections with a header. And I've, I've had the, the pleasure of reading it cover to cover and it's neat relating it back to my experience where it fits in, in the creators workshop, but it's going to be now that I've gone through it front to back, it'll be a book that when I'm sitting down to do my daily work or to do my practice, that if I'm feeling stuck, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to read what's there. Yeah. Because it's a book that is geared in my mind towards moving people forward into their practice. Yeah. That's great. You made my day. Wow. Well, I didn't know that was my goal when we showed up here. Um, even if it wasn't your goal, it's even better. It's <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> oh, so what a pleasure to have you here. Um, I, uh, I recommend both the book and the Creators Workshop, obviously without hesitation. Um, don't do it unless you're really ready to go out and, uh, and give and receive and work your butt off. And, uh, and so it's just been a pleasure and a privilege to have you here to be able to break down some of these things. And well, thank, you. Uh, thank you for the yeah. leadership. Thank you for your kindness. Uh, it's been fun to talk about the book and to talk about your work as well. So thank you. Fantastic, Seth. You're aces. <laughs>